ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನಾಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹವೀರ್ಯಂ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವದೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾಷಾವಹಾಯಿ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 and will attempt to share the screen here we go january 7th in asia <clears throat> see what we have in store today this one move here we go first topic nine ways of merging with shiva from the introduction to merging with shiva guru dev says merger that is what this book the third book in the trilogy of dancing with shiva living with shiva and merging with shiva is all about some of the big questions about something as wonderful as becoming one with the universe or with god are is merger something to accomplish in this lifetime or shall we put it off to another round is merger something that we that can be achieved even in future lives or should we consider that it might never happen <laughs> or that it just might happen unexpectedly is merger with shiva complete annihilation an undesirable nothingness that we should delay as long as possible shall we cease all striving for realization and wait for mahapralaya the end of the universe the great dissolution commanded by lord shiva when every soul young or old merges in the all of the all no exceptions no one left behind the ultimate perk of the divine cosmic drama the guarantee of final merger of every soul fortunately the next big bang may happen after shiva gets lonely dancing by himself and starts his creation all over again Oh, lots of ways of looking at it <clears throat> merger on the great inner path described in this book is already happening in your life and in the life of every soul on the planet in the natural course of evolution meaning soul evolution of course sanskrit we express merging with shiva as shiva shiva sayuja intimate union with the divine nine progressive ways of merging with shiva are possible today in fact impossible to avoid shall we now explore these nine ways the wonderful ways of merging with shiva as we walk the san marga the straight path of dharma and what the question to you is what is the first merger see who remembers to go through this nine times first merger second merger etc a jiva or soul merges with his potential mother who gives a physical body to which his astral body is attached this is the first merger what is the second merger then when his first guru the parents train him to quell the instinctive mind to become a producing member of the family and the social and global communities the second merger occurs why should these two developments be related to merging with the supreme it is because shiva is the life of our lives as the venerable saints teach shiva is the life of the life of all sentient and insentient beings the sea of prana ever emanating mysteriously from the all of the allness of his mystery being by which all life exists and all happenings happen therefore to merge energies with all of the human beings without making differences is to find shivaness in all and within all what is the third merger
having merged with the biological and social worlds. It then is for the young jiva embodied soul to be introduced by the parents to the family guru for spiritual training. Obedience and devotion to the guru is again another merger into shivaness. For the Satguru is Sada Shiva, or Shiva in form, having realized Shiva in formlessness. It is from the Satguru's constant silent emanation that the Shishya thrives, as do flowering trees, bushes, and vines thrive and grow from the sun's silent rays and the occasional showers of rain. No words need be spoken, for both Shishya and Guru know the same. The Shishya, having had his training in scripture, divine inspiration of song, meaning, and dance from his first guru, the parents. What is the fourth merger? Having walked the San Marga through the Chari and Kriya Margas, and having disciplined mind and emotions, the Shishi is ready for the fourth merger into Shivanas. This is accomplished through art, calligraphy, drawing divine forms, writing out scripture in one's own hand, and depicting through drama, by learning and playing music, by having all bodily currents move into the rhythm of the sounds of nature, for nature is nada in the external. It has its own choreography, and this merger is with Nataraja, Lord of the Dance. It is also the merger with knowledge of all kinds of language and mathematics of the many sciences and arts. What is the fifth merger? Now we start going deeper. Fifth merger is deeper, <laughs> okay. Endeavoring to penetrate the intuitive world communing with nature, encountering the many dreams, visions, and other mystical experiences that await the seeker of truth, capital T. It is merger with the selfless life of seeing oneself in others and others in oneself, losing the barriers that divide one from another and the internal world from the external world. It is living a harmonious life with a heart filled with love, trust, and understanding for all, desiring to give rather than wanting only to receive. And moving on, what is the sixth merger? The light that lights each thought picture when traced to its source is the sixth merger. The yoga of detaching awareness from that which it is aware of and being the light that lights the thoughts rather than claiming identity as being the thoughts, then tracing this light of the mind out of the mind into the beyond of the beyond. Yea, this is the sixth way we merge into the divine. The Lord of the dance emanates his own lighting effects, does his own choreography, creates his own music and enjoys, as the audience, his own performance. Because Shiva, of course, is everyone. What is the seventh merger? The seventh merger is into the Nada Nadi Shakti, that unrelenting sound heard as an inexplainable E of a thousand Venas being played simultaneously by Vena Dara, another form of Lord Shiva the maker of sound, the composer of the symphony. The nada is traced to its source, deep within the within, the city of a thousand lights and sounds, for sound is light, and light is sound in this sphere of Satchit Ananda, all-pervasive oneness with all form, the self flowing through the mind, untouched by it, yet sustaining it in a mightily mysterious way. Okay, and the eighth merger. Eighth merger with Shiva is Parashiva, 
Coming and being timeless, formless, spaceless is the total transformation of the soul body, the mental body, the astral body, the pranic body, and the physical body. It is the breaking of seals which subs <laughs> it is the breaking of seals which subsequently makes changes never to be repaired. A new and entirely new process begins. It is the ultimate healing of all karmas, the ultimate knowing of Dharma. And the ninth one's the easiest, ninth and last. What is the ninth merger? And now, lastly, once the soul evolves out of the physical, pranic, emotional, mental, and causal sheaths, anamaya, pranamaya, manomaya, vijjanamaya, and anandamaya koshas, they are needed no more. It evolves into Vishvagrasa, the ninth and final merger with Shiva. As an infant effortlessly becomes a child, a child a youth, and a youth an adult. Yes, the soul, Jiva, encased in five bodies, is indeed merged into the emanator, preserver, and absorber of the inner and outer universes as simply as a drop of water merges into the ocean, <clears throat> never to be found again. This is a timeless path the holy Vedas of the Sanatana Dharma proclaim. As a seed becomes a bud and a bud becomes a flower, these nine steps, spiritual and foemen, are inevitable for all humankind. Parallel analysis known as Dasha Karyam to entertainments is found in ancient Tamil texts. So that's the last one. The way I like to explain it is this creation of the soul, it's like taking a bucket, dipping it in the ocean. So the water represents consciousness. Now, now we have a consciousness that's separated from the ocean. And that's the consciousness that goes through all the experiences. And then in the end, it gets dumped back into the ocean. So it's always consciousness. It's just the separateness is what gets created. So let's take a look. Tama Lexicon <clears throat> gives these definitions. Interesting parallel. Dasakariyam. Thus is ten. Ten spiritual experiences of the soul in his path toward final deliverance. Tattuva Rupam. Spiritual experience of the soul in which it is cognizant of the operations of the 36 tattvas. So that's the base point. Tat 36 tattvas, the most subtle ones are super consciousness, but the rest are just ordinary life. So we're, we're aware of life outside of us and inside of us, ordinary life. That's where we start. Tattuva darshanam, the spiritual experience of the soul, and when it in which it realizes that the 36 tattvas are the outcome of maya and are inert matter. So that's getting a better a darshan, a better insight into what the tattvas are or what the material and mental world is. <clears throat> Tattva shuddhi, spiritual experience of the soul in which it no longer in which it is no longer influenced by the 36 tattvas and knows itself to be an entity different from them. So that's separating awareness from consciousness. That's the way Gurudev explains that. It's no longer influenced by the 36 tattvas and knows itself to be an entity different from them. Whereas before, the soul thought it was them. <clears throat> Who oh, it is now the observer, Satjin. Then we move on. Soul, Anma, Tamil word for soul, equivalent of Atma. Anma Rupam. 
spiritual experience of the soul in which, when free from corruption, it discovers that its form is intelligence. So, rupam form. So, it's understanding the form of the soul. Anmadarshanam, insights, spiritual experience of the soul in which it realizes that it cannot act independently. So, that's the idea of grace. Surrender. And then the shuddhi, anma shuddhi, a spiritual experience of the soul in which the soul effaces itself and is established in divine grace. Very nice. Then we get Shiva. Shiva Rupam. Spiritual experience of the soul in which it clearly understands that Shiva, by his five gracious functions, cleanses it of mala, malam, and bestows salvation. Shiva darshanam, spiritual experience of the soul in which it understands its own limitations and perceives the divine wisdom which of its own accord bestows grace. Shiva Yogam, so we've got yoga happening finally. Spiritual experience of the soul in which it realizes the omnitude of Shiva and sets itself in tune with him without losing its individuality. Shiva Bhogam, spiritual experience of the soul in which it merges its individuality in Shiva, a supreme being. Merger. So there we go. Loses individuality in Shiva. Same ideas in Guru's, Guru Deva's nine ways of merging with Shiva, same, same ending. So isn't that amazing? All these terms are right there in the University of Madras Tamil lexicon, which of course is drawing them from Tamil scripture. <clears throat> It actually has references, so you can look at it, see the scripture it's in, and then go find it if you were um, skilled enough in Tamil. And moving on, our second topic, see what we've got. Answering questions sent in to satsang at hindu.org. We got a number of questions in recently. Can you speak to the differences progression from Savakalpa and Nirvikalpa Samadhi? The question has two parts. Let's look at first the difference between the two types of Samadhi. And we start with our Hamayan Academy lexicon definition. Samadhi, sameness, contemplation, union, wholeness, completion, accomplishment. Samadhi is a state of true yoga in which the meditator and the object of meditation are one. So that's true of all states of samadhi. Usually you're meditating on something and it's separate from you. Even if you're learning about it, you feel it's separate from you. But when what you're meditating on and you are the same thing, then it qualifies as samadhi. Samadhi is a state of true yoga in which the meditator and the object of meditation are one. Samadhi is of two levels. The first is Savakalpa Samadhi, ecstasy with form or seed, identification or oneness with the essence of an object. Its highest form is the realization of the primal substratum or pure consciousness. Satchit Ananda. So how would you explain Satchit Ananda? Say someone asked you, doesn't know much about it. What does Satchit Ananda mean? How would you explain that? In other words, a practical definition rather than a scholarly one.
As an analogy, let's look at a Japa Mala of Rudraksha beads. It consists of 108 regular beads and one extra bead, known as the God bead. Each bead represents a soul, and the God bead represents God, the bead in this analogy. If the bead is consciousness of being a bead, it sees itself as separate from all the other beads and from the Mala's special God bead. However, what is inside the beads? It is a thread and there is only one thread. Thus, if a bead turns within deeply enough and is only aware of the thread inside that is comparable to experiencing God Shiva's omnipresent consciousness of Satchit Ananda, which is the deepest form of Savakalpa Samadhi. In the first lesson of Living with Shiva, Gurudeva talks about Yoga Swami and seeing God within everyone. My Satguru, Shiva Yoga Swami, was a great Siddha, a master and a knower of God. He was a powerful mystic from Sri Lanka near India, perhaps the greatest to live in the 20th century. His words drove deeply into the hearts of all who heard them. To quote Yoga Swami, God is in everyone. See him there. God is overwhelmingly present everywhere. Regard everything as a manifestation of God and you will realize the truth. These were his words, simple words for a simple truth, but very, very difficult to practice. So back to our Rudraksha beads. In other words, Savakalpa Samadhi is when looking at others, you don't see the person. You see Shiva within them as omnipresent consciousness and therefore you are the other person as well as still yourself. Padamagu Yoga Swami described this state in the following way. sat chit ananda That is one thing. sat chit ananda Sat is who you are. Chit is omnipresence. Prakasha, light is from the sun, all-knowing. Ananda is bliss. They are three, but they are one. That is your nature. Yoga Swami always brings these profound teachings down to that's you. It's not just me or it's not just Shiva. It's also you. So that great attainment is you. Second level of samadhi, nirvakalpa samadhi, ends to see without form or seed. Identification with the self in which all modes of consciousness are transcended. An absolute reality, parashiva, beyond time, form, and space, is experienced. This brings in its aftermath a complete transformation of consciousness. And one of the great statements about this is Gurudeva's self-God talk. You visualize above you nothing, below you nothing, to the right of you nothing, to the left of you of nothing, in front of you nothing, in back of you nothing, and, dull, <laughs> and dissolve yourself into that nothingness. That would be the best way you could explain the realization of the self. And yet that nothingness would not be the absence of something, like the nothingness inside an empty box. It would be like a void. That nothingness is the fullness of everything the power, the sustaining power of the existence of what appears to be everything. And we have a Yoga Swami quote on nothingness. <clears throat> I climbed Mount Everest in three days. So that's, of course, the Sarasvara. It's not the actual mountain. Sarasvara Chakra. There, there is nothing. No sun, no moon. Then you come down and there is dharma, adharma, and all things. How would you explain the relationship between Parashiva and Parashakti or Satchit Ananda? The question to you. Is there a relationship? If so, what is it?
a way to conceptualize the relationship and difference between para shakti and para shiva is through a visualization of a shower first imagine water coming out of the shower head then imagine that the shower head is invisible but water still comes out of it para shakti is somehow coming out of the nothingness that is para shiva So Parashiva is the transcendent source of Parashakti or Satchir Ananda. But it's an invisible source. It's a nothingness. Back to the question, can you speak to the differences, progression from Sapakalpa and Nirvakalpa Samadhi? The question has two parts, second part. Progression from Sapakalpa to Nirvakalpa Samadhi. In meditation, identifying with the Hayi sound is a type of Savakalpa Samadhi. Gurudeva gives this description. The nada is that incomprehensible high-pitched E sounding within the head. That incomparable source of inner security, contentment, and outpouring of love. When you hear the nada, endeavor to project it in love's outpouring to all those who are in your orbit of communication. They will feel the blessings when your divine love is projected through your nada into their nada. This is the height of selfless consciousness. Universal love, a constant mystical outpouring and experience of oneness. The sushumna is nada and more. Nada shakti is. It just is. In the shum language, listening in this way to the hayi is called e kaif. Gurudeva gave this definition. A state between kaif and im kaif, when we only hear the nada or e, and when we are totally aware of it with no distractions. This is called e kaif. And my comment to progress from the Savakalpa Samadhi of hearing the high e sound and Nirvakalpa Samadhi requires looking for the transcendent source of that sound. Said another way, becoming aware of it in deeper and deeper areas of superconsciousness until we reach the transcendent source. As an example, the high sound at a more subtle level becomes the soundless sound. Then at even deeper level is what Gurudeva calls being on the brink of the absolute. One final quote from Gurudeva on this idea. Listening to the nada, as it is called in Sanskrit, or nada nadi shakti, brings this threshold of bliss and shows that the balance of all karmas has been attained. Listening to the nada and tracing it to into its source carries the seeker's awareness to the brink of the absolute. So idea of tracing it to its source. And of course, my comment, the final step is to move from the brink of the absolute to realize in the absolute, which is the level of nirvikalpa samadhi. And a very brief third topic, quotes from Yoga Swami, words of our master. Make the prana to rise, enough of reading, how would you explain that statement? Making the prana to rise refers to going within in meditation. Yoga Swami is saying reading is not enough. We also need to meditate. And it's the same idea as intellectual concepts are good, such as the inner light is caused by the friction between odic and actinic force. And being able to answer the question on the test, what is the cause of the inner light? It is the meeting, it's the meeting of actinic and odic force. But we also need to be able to experience it. So to do that, we need to set aside reading and make the prana, the energies, Go up into the higher chakras. Oh, thank you very much.